It's got to be a Friday. It's got to be a Friday. Yeah. 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 I can't keep up. No. It's got to be a Friday. This sounds like a good play. <laughs> Only work every other Friday. I'm going to give the introduction and off you go. Uh, if you want, it might be better if we just slide up in here because these guys will be doing the uh, discussion. Uh, so first off, Keith, Breno and all, thank you very much for allowing us to come here. We've been doing this about a, a year, yeah. kind of going around and doing this in different stations. Oh. Please fly in. Animal control, we actually grabbed some uh, Coca-Cola uh, truckers because they drive a lot during the snow, off weather, they have to travel. And the main component, and uh, Mark and Nick, and Nick will go through with their primary line work, as you probably see them all the time around here. Uh, Jeff Merritt, he's the director of, uh, I don't know what he does either. He's the director of... Uh, <laughs> I'm directing. Uh, the overhead running the storms. Dennis McCaffrey's uh, with my team as well on this side. And, and what this is really is, it's kind of 101 electric to a degree, going back on just how dangerous the wires are. Um, what happens when a wire is down, cable, you don't know. Uh, you'll hear it repeated numerous times. We don't consider something dead until we check it. And I'd recommend that you know others consider that one as, as well. And we're gonna demonstrate it just because of hooking on fences. Uh, Mark will go through what we're running here for electricity, but as he says, this is mine if you to put the substations are running over here, and it's not gonna get a sense of what you're doing on it. Uh, We've done a number of other items on poles, uh, recloses, we'll get into it. So it's it, it's good, but you also have to understand that how could the oil come right back on. So again, it might be dead at one point, come back on again. Um, and we're going to demonstrate just ladders. You know, one of the things primary is when our guys are riding around, if we see something close to a, a primary, we'll stop because we don't want to go over there and you guys shouldn't have to go over there for someone stupid going near a wire. We actually did one, I think they were doing the um, we did one of these sessions and a, and a um, cruiser was riding by and they were actually putting the uh, scoreboard into the new stadium and they had a crane going over, three phase right over. So they, they actually cruiser stopped and, and asked the guy to you know, kind of pull it off from this end. It's just more just a refresher. And we're going to do some, we got a broccoli squirrel that we're going to demonstrate of what the loud bang is uh, that you might hear. And that's usually when the police go, you know, I heard a bang, that type of thing from that end. And um, we're gonna do uh, actually a fire boot on a down wire and seeing how a fire boot can catch fire as well. So, you know, again, it, it's it's a little refresher from that end. And the big thing on this <coughs> is um, during storms, if, if we get a lot of customers calling in, they'll probably call your dispatch center, your dispatch center is gonna call us. That isn't gonna speed it up, it's actually gonna confuse the system a little bit. So we just want to know, we just want to get out that all customers, if there's an outage, best thing they can do is call. Because if, if Chief Gretel calls, Dennis calls, I call within a certain area of Whitman, the technology is smart enough to say, hey, it's going, there's an issue right here with three people calling from that end. If dispatch calls, it's just coming in as 911 number, and it's just going to kind of come in from your station. So the system is going to say where the issue is. So it's better that any customers, if you know it, get it out on the cable. If there's an outage, even though it might not be a smart system, it is a smart system once we get the information on it, and we'll speed it up. And the other component, we'll go through it during storms. Before we energize, we have to check every feeder, every wire riding down. So you may see a truck riding down, steering up into the sky. It's not that they're thinking about wonderful things and how great National Grid is. It's actually looking and saying how the wires all connected. Because before I energize, I don't want a cable connected to a primary on a railing and someone comes outside their porch and, scra and grabs a railing. So we're not going to turn power on until we're safe and we know what's going on. Uh, during the I know Jeff had about 3,000 people working around in this area. We've seen them get hit a lot. And that's our guys, that's tree guys, that's some other um, National Grid from New York, or even other resources. So it's imperative that before we energize, we make sure everything's safe from that end. Um, Mike has a bunch of show and tells. It's a great thing, it's about 40 minutes. It's ideal that Q&A, questions, these guys are doing it every day. 
um, and they'll give you the, the real stuff, what's going on. So, Mark, if I could turn Joe, it over. thank you. Uh, again, I just want to welcome you to our live line demonstration. Like Joe said, my name is Mark Ennis. I've been with National Grid 15 years. I'm a crew leader out of Brockton. But I also, guys, I'm on your side. I'm a call firefighter in the town of Rainham. I got 16 years here. So I wear both hats. So, you know, kind of hits home, you know, training you guys, police and fire. Nick Briggs, first class lineman out of Brockton. He's got eight years with the company. What we have, guys, is it's a real deal. You know, we're, we're producing electricity with this generator. And, you know, it's not make believe. You know, we can't produce the amperage like we have out here on the main road. But we are producing about 8,000 volts of electricity. So um, with that being said, I just got out some show and tell. Everybody thinks big Y and big power, guys. That's not true. This little piece of number six copper can carry the same voltage as this piece of 477. So don't think little wire, you know, little power. That's not true because we do use this wire for a primary conductor at 8,000 volts of electricity. This right here is what we call spacer cable. Uh, we run this in the water tree heavily treated areas on. You have your conductor on the inside, which is surrounded by a hard plastic cover. We do not consider this an insulator, but if a tree was to make contact with this, it's not gonna blow a fuse like a bare aluminum conductor would. So it does add some protection with incident contact. And this right here is a water UID development this day and age, running the power lines underground. And this is, um, just a piece of underground cable. In the center, you have your conductor surrounded by your ground. So a lot of times, you know, snowstorms, those little green pads are hit. Just be aware, you know, call National Grid because when this comes up out of the ground, it goes to an elbow to that green pad, and, you know, it could very well get, you know, pinched and, you know, could be energized. Even on pole hits, there's stuff runs <coughs> up the pole to connect to the other Pole hits, cock and hit it, that could be pinched. Somewhere. Guys, the other thing I want to touch on, you know, we've all been to that motor vehicle crash, you know, car into the pole, top of the pole is sheared off, it's being held up by the wires, and nine out of ten times there's a transformer on that pole. But I want to point out, this is how we tie a conductor into an insulator, we call it bridle tie. But I'll pass this around, this is, um, this is what we use to tie it in, you can see it's a very pliable piece of plastic, so just be aware when we're walking under that pole being held up by the wires. The only thing holding up that wire and that transformer is this little piece of aluminum tie wire. So that's that's uh, how we tie it in. So just keep that in mind. You know, the other thing uh, at a motor vehicle crash, I just want to point out, you know, when myself, Nick, we pull up to a motor vehicle crash, we look a couple poles before and a couple poles after because you don't know what happened with that that impact. You know, did a phone loop get ripped off the house and that was recoiled up into the primary that you know could be energizing a fence? A couple poles up and a couple poles down. So um, just keep that in mind. This is what we call a cutout. We've all seen them. Uh, you know, ideally the electricity comes in the top, comes through this fuse holder, which we call it out the bottom, out to the, the line. The uh, fault is created, the fuse in here, which I'll talk about, blows, and this falls down. Sometimes it, you know, they get full of garbage and they won't fall down. So sometimes you get that call, you know, a fire on the pole, and um, these will be burning, the garbage in there will burn. Don't think because this door's down that there's no power going through there. Because there's still a lot of these kind of cutouts out there. That crack, the power's tracking right through it. It's still going out. So just because this is down, doesn't mean the power's out. Guys, this right here, um, you know, everybody thinks, you know, 120 volts is nothing. We've all been in our house, taken our screwdriver, we've gotten into the outlet, and we pop the circuit breaker. This knife right here, I'm going to pass around, we're blown apart with 120 volts. So I don't think 120 volts is nothing. That was blown apart. Just look at all the business card with it. Yep. <laughs> Actually, that was um, my work. He was up in a uh, secondary conductor. He got his knife between the conductor and the ground, the neutral. You know, split second, you know, blew it apart like that. 120 volts is 
nothing to shake a stick at. You know, 13,000 volts, that'll hurt. 120 volts is going to kill you fast. You know, that 120 volts will sit there and hold on you. 13,000 volts will blow you off the pole. You wish you were dead. <laughs> you know, this right here, I'll pass this around. This is the fuses we, we use, and you might say, you know, this is a 10 amp fuse. You might say 10 amps, but I got a 400 amp service in my house. The higher the voltage, the less the amperage. So that's how we can get away with a 10 amp fuse on a transformer. So that little piece of wire we can pass around, that's, that's the actual fuse right there. That little piece of wire right there, yeah. And this right here, this is a 200 amp fuse. And you can see that this is pop up. I try to use the analogy, uh, a, fu a fuse, you know, with a fusible link and a sprinkler head. Enough water, enough heat is generated, it melts a fusible link, and we have water flow. Pretty much the same concept with a fuse on the street. Enough fault current is generated, and blows a fuse. And that's where you hear that loud bang. I've been doing this for the past year, so I did a little bit of research on an arc flash. An arc flash can produce temperatures up to 34,000 degrees in one one tenth of a second. And I'll just have to prove this was a call in Stoughton had a squirrel get between the conductor and the ground and actually melted the copper and infused it into the porcelain. And then this was a, a phase that came down in a gravel pit and just burned and turned the gravel to glass. <coughs> I'm going to pass around this picture, guys. This was a local fire department. I'm not going to say where it was. And I don't have to say any more after you look at the picture. You know, right across the street from a down conductor that's burning in the street. Is that on? Um, you can see the front wire. That's the conductor right here, the three phase. Hang burning in the street. And you can see. You know, yeah, and you can see how close they parked the apparatus. Please, Kyle, in your plane. <laughs> All right, guys, um, we're going to start a demonstration. What we're going to do, because we have a generator producing about 8,000 volts of electricity, and when we make that contact, you're going to see that the generator really bogs down. That substation over on Plymouth Street in Abington isn't gonna see, you know, that 100 foot aerial into the power lines or that ladder or whatever, that contract or the piece of gutter. It's just gonna do what it's asked to do is produce electricity. Mark, do you want, before you do it, just in terms of the, uh, with the safety component, PPE and all okay. that, what we go through with the gloves. Yes. Actually, That's our rubber we gloves, with every day. we test once a day prior to us using them and then every, Three months, they're actually sent out and actually professionally tested at a lab. And you know, feel free to put them on. You feel fast, you lose your finger dexterity. <laughs> you know, cold as the son of a gun in the winter, and in the summer, they are hot as blazes. And every day you check them? You yep, with prior to us using them, we, check, we do an air test with them. You know, in our, our clothing we wear, we wear our, an FR clothing with our I believe it's going to be 10 calories or higher with a rating, you know. This one's 36. So that means that we're going to produce um, about 8,000 volts of electricity. We're going to put the ladder up against the power lines and show what happens. But it doesn't have to be a ladder, guys. It could be that 100-foot aerial. It could be that contractor on some stage and slide in a piece of gutter out. Or that homeowner, you know, cutting trees down. Anything conductive. Electricity is looking for that path to ground, and however, it, whatever it needs to get there, it's going to take. And like the old saying says, is when you see the light, it's too late.
as you can see, once Nick made contact with the ladder, you could see that electricity jumping. You know, humidity plays a big role in it, you know, water being a conductor. So once it's made and he pulled it away, that arc was still looking for that path to ground. That's what it would look like if the homeowner was doing his own siding. Back that ladder up into the primaries and then pulled it away. Except he doesn't have these on. You know, uh, next demonstration we're going to do, we're going to energize the fence here and we're going to take a leather glove and we're going to show that in a leather glove doesn't have any insulating value. And you know, prior to, you know, what touching the fence, you know, you look at the fence and you know, it's a 50-50 shot. Is it energized or is it not energized? You know, and that could be from your motor vehicle crash, a couple pulls up, you know, a down conductor on that fence. This is also part of the patrol from a storm wise down before we energize that feeder. That's what we're looking at. Exactly, like Joe said, you know, you might see us driving around with our lights on, you know, and that's being said as we start from where the electricity originates at the substation and we follow it to the very end, that last service to that house because myself, Nick, we don't want to give the okay to energize a feeder and we didn't patrol it 100% and there's a, a primary on someone's house or a secondary conductor you know, in a sandbox, and now we energize it and, you know, potentially have hurt someone or, you know, caught a house on fire. So that's why we patrol everything. You know, come the nighttime, you know, it's even harder because, you know, visibility is hard, hard to see, and that's what, how we, you know, that's our protocol. There are some right of ways where there could be four foot embankments of snow walking through, so. You know, like, great point over the uh, right of way that, you know, over here in Whitman where the lines cross the right of ways, you know, you might be driving in at night and see on the power lines, you know, some red flashes. Those are called um, fault indicators. That um, indicates if there's a tree that comes down in the right of way on the power lines, that fault is going to go through those lights and they're going to light up. And that's just, um, that just helps us out. You know, our dispatch might say go to Main Street where the line crosses and there's a set of fault indicators. If they're lit, we know that the fault is in that right away. It just helps, you know, you know, determining where it might be. Guys, our next demonstration, we're going to use a hot dog. Pretty much, we're going to use that to simulate our finger. Pretty much the same consistency. And we're going to show what would happen if you were to make contact.
see, you know, a hot dog, you know, what happened. Our next demonstration we're going to do is um, we're going to simulate a live conducted down on the ground with step potential. We have fireman's boot, steel toe, steel shank. I try to use the analogy, guys, is, um, you throw a rock in a pond. So that rock has entered the pond. Your ripples are real close together. And as you get farther away from that point of impact, your ripples get farther apart. Pretty much the same idea with a down conductor. The closer you are to that down conductor, you, the electricity is close together, and as you get farther away, obviously it dissipates in the ground. So that's why they say to, to shuffle, because as soon as, as soon as you were to take a step, your left foot is at a different potential as your right foot, and that's what's going to get you. So they say to shuff, you know, shuffle your feet so you're not at a different potential. Same thing, you know, with a, we'll use a bus or a car, if that car was energized. If you were to get out of that car with one foot in, one foot out, that's what's going to get you. So they always say, you know, to jump like a rabbit, you know, so you're at the same potential. Recommend to stay in the car, <laughs> yeah. 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 unless there's something on it. So now we're just going to simulate the boot with a live conductor. Next demonstration we're going to do with this gonna, we're going to blow a transformer fuse. We've all gotten that call. We've heard a loud bang and the lights have gone out. Nine out of ten times it's that squirrel making contact on top of the transformer, blowing a fuse. You know, during, during a storm it could be that tree branch, you know, that's come down across the phases and blows the fuse, or you know, the bird. And we're just going to simulate the blowing of the, the fuse. Even the balloons, right? Yeah. Better parties. Anything, you know, yeah. that contact. So Chief Reynolds house for a birthday party. <laughs> like I say, guys, you know, we're all out there during a storm. There's no, there's no I in team. You know, police, fire, DPW. You know, we all want to go home the way we came into work. You know, we're all here to make, to make a good living and go home to what we really enjoy, our family. Where's the squirrel from again, Mark? Yeah, she brought it. Brock Main Street. <laughs> Just so you know, there is no live animals harmed in this demonstration. <laughs> Well, what, yeah. So one of the things we, we, we're actually demonstrating now, next thing that Mark will do after, but it's the generators. Everyone's getting the generators. You can buy a hookup. If they're not hooked up properly, this is actually going to show something. But uh, Nick and Mark are trying to do something with a fire hose today. This is to show you the fire hose that can conduct electricity. I'll show you when I put this up there, and we have a high voltage test up, I can show you that the voltage will be at the top, and the voltage will go right through the fire hose to the bottom. Like I said, in, earlier in Joe's presentation, we, Joe said we don't consider anything dead until we actually physically test it with a high voltage tester and then ground it. At that point, we'll consider it dead, but up until then, we consider every conductor energized until proven not and grounded. All of you guys can see. The little meter pulled up. We got both. So right now, I got full voltage at the top. 
full voltage right there on the hose. Full voltage all the way through the fire hose. I believe the inside of them is rubber. Surrounded with rubber. That's the control. Just uh, the canvas and the water and everything else. Our next demonstration we're going to do is, uh, you know, this day and age, you can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, you can buy a $300 generator, and they'll sell you the pigtail to go from your generator to your dryer outlet. You know, that's not the proper way to do it. Obviously, the proper way, you know, transfer a switch, licensed electrician, you know, inspect it. We're just going to show what happens. You know, you might think during a major storm that the whole town of Whitman is de-energized, or you see that fuse hanging, thinking that the area is de-energized. So you go down there, complacent, that primary that's hanging in the trees, you get out of your piece of apparatus, thinking that it's de-energized and it's energized. We're going to show that ideally the transformer likes 8,000 volts of electricity in the top. Goes through the windings, it comes out and gives you 12240. But if you were to provide that transformer with 12240, it's in return is going to give you 8,000 volts of electricity. Transformers are stupid. They'll take power either way and produce it either way. And we're just going to show the improper hookup of a generator. It's going to go through your dryer outlet, your main panel, out your service entrance, out to your triplex, and into your transformer, through that cutout, and out onto your primary wire that's hanging, you know, in the trees or in the street. So we just want to show the improper hookup. Yeah, right? That's just it. We're going to get a hookup on that. No more new plants. What's going on? Those are the improper right? The white light being your home, and the red light being we're also going to prove it up with a high voltage tester. Right there, our white light, our red light. Yeah. So this, this is someone just buying a generator, bring it to the house, and slam it to the dryer out there, going, I got power! They haven't flipped over any bands or anything. But we now have 8,000 volts right there. This whole triplex is heated up with 140 volts, 240 now. It's not a good sight. Now we're going to show the proper way of going into a transfer switch, which will only allow you to be on either utility power or generator power. Now they put it to the generator, they put their main, they have power. No more power on there. utility supply back to them to let them actually generate supply electricity in the house. Without that, they kind of isolate themselves. But there's still a risk there. So that isolates us from the system. The risk is both from a weight load on, on the roof for you guys. So going up on that roof, you see all the solar panels, a big risk there. And what we learned yesterday from one of the presentations was that those solar panels, the only way to shut them off really is to put a covering over them. So when you guys are going up on the roof and you have to cut into a roof and vent or whatever whatever you have to do, you gotta be very cautious of those solar panels because unless you cover them or it's a completely black night out and there's no there's no light on it, that's the only way they stop generating. And the covering is you can't just, you know, the regular blue and white top stay through it. That isn't the right thing. That that's not gonna go. And um, they're 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 all affixed. So you're talking it's not small little piece of wood, it's some shingles. You're talking at least 30, 40 pounds of each section. So you're adding some weight on that roof. Well, the other thing is, we go to a house, we ask the National Grid to shut the power yeah. off because we're going to be pulling ceilings, opening up yep. walls. The stuff's still, still. juice. Yep. Unless, so, you, unless you stop the lights, and that's the key right. component. There's no way you're going to get the door. Right. You know, you don't yep. get so many guys, so much equipment. Right. So, I mean, they're putting these things all over town. No one's once called us up and say, hey, yeah. come on down and look at this. Now, on, 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 the on the ground based, though, I mean, if you want to talk on the, yep. you know, the land based, totally different in terms of that, right? Correct. On the, you know, the big 
commercial Field. customers, Field. we yeah. have, you know, redund redundancy on them producing power out to us. There's a recloser, there's a switch, you know, that they have to supply, and then company supplies. So there's multiple redundancies to keep them from putting power on our grid if, if don't we don't want it. want it. You know, the other thing is, uh, you know, on the solar panels on the roof, just keep that in mind, guys, up there. You know, we're up there venting the roof and there's solar panels. I did some research. It's about 600 volts of DC current leaving those panels going to that inverter where it converts it from DC to AC. So you're up there venting the roof. Just keep in mind, where is that cable when it's leaving the panels getting down to that inverter, you know, before you cut? Just keep, you know. There should be a switch before the inverter to shut off the inverter. There should be a switch after the inverter to shut off the AC. Even if you shut off both of those switches, those panels are still producing power. No Down that cable. Yeah, have you guys had any calls or problems about them? Like you got any those switches maybe not working or someone saying I have you know, this is too much or not enough? No, we haven't we haven't had anything on that, no. And You'll be getting them. Yeah, more and, than and, same, and plus, even more, no. even some of that, there's, you know, that solar, the other energy, you, you're, there's a lot of it going on. Um, if you start to put batteries now, so you're stirring the power and the batteries going back. So there's a little bit more when you go into a house, and almost like from a gas perspective. If you ride up to a house and you see a gas meter with a regulator outside, all right, that's elevated pressure. So you know there's an elevated pressure going on on that side, so before you're going in. But also now when you ride up from a house, you almost have to look at the solar panels. Now you know you, you, you have, as Mark said, you have other items you have to deal with on the roof. But also know that some of this in the house, they can be stored in the batteries down below. Right. Uh, from the, uh, at least the understanding, if the panel is on, you know, the smoke from it, that isn't hazardous from that degree, you know, going up. But you're still dealing with not only the wise doing it, but also a tripping hazard too, you know, from that end. You know, the other thing I want to put on, you know, the house fire, you guys asked to have the meter pulled from the house. We'll pull the meter and seal it, but just keep in mind that that service entrance coming down the side of the house is still energized. You know, if you guys prefer, we, you know, if you ask, we can cut it out the street. But if we don't, it's still energized coming down the side of the house, you know, to that meter socket. Usually, if you cut it off at the street, by the time you get there, you can't get near the house right. anyway. Yeah. It's a truck. Couple houses away. Yeah. And, and we and we do certain areas, like say some of the storms with Chief Judge Open situate, knowing that some of those streets and the, the numbered streets get flooded a lot as we build up, you know, and again Chief Reno working with him before storms, three day checklist, four day trying to work it all. We'll speak with Chief Judge down that and say, you know, if, if that coastal storm's coming in, we're already for plan, you better let us know though, if you want to bang that power. You know, we we can isolate it from that area. So you know, going to that point, it's similar on that side, up this way that we, we can do it. But in terms of knowing that we're, we're now shutting power, certain areas, high rises, you never know who's on elevators. Certain areas, you might have hospitals, you never know from a quick shut off, you know, who's on it, you know, that type of thing. And they got to check the generators, make sure they're working all that. So we're able to do it from a larger concept, smaller ones, yeah, we can just pull from that in. Like I say, guys, you know, feel free to ask any questions. You want to pull us aside and ask questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question, you know. We're all in it together during a storm. You know, you see, have a problem, you see a truck, you know, pull up and ask, you know, the truck. I know I'll speak to, for all the guys in Brockton that I work with. None of us will, you know, you know, not help you in any way. And the other, just in terms of the infrastructure, a lot of, there's a lot of money going in, substations, a lot of improvements, a lot of improvements on the road, you know, tree trimming. But also, if you want to touch on the reclosures, you know, running through that thing um, from that end. Right. That might be Actually, helpful. what we have, uh, we have out on the lines is uh, what's called reclosures. Pretty much a reliability, from a reliability standpoint. You know, engineering determines where they want to put them. And what it does is, instead of losing a whole feeder, we'll call it a whole line, They'll put them in a certain place. I believe there's one right up on Rainer Ave, right by the rotary. There's uh, one right at the end of Essex Street. Essex Street. And it feeds down this way. So if there was a problem here, that recloser is going to see that fault, we'll say, a tree branch. And it's going to open up. And everything from that recloser out this way will be de-energized. But everything from the substation to that recloser will be energized. 
And the way it works is a tree branch comes across the power lines that reclose up, sees that fault, it's going to open up for a couple seconds, and after that time frame has gone by, it's going to close back in. If that tree branch, that bird, that squirrel has, you know, burnt off or blown off, everybody's fine. You know, lights are going to stay on. But if it's still there, it's going to open back up for another three seconds. It's going to do that for three times, and after the third time, it's going to stay walked out, and that's when we physically come out and patrol it and find the problem. So that's why your you lights might come on and off a couple times and stay on or stay off, and that's what it is. When we work on the line, we take that reclosing relay off. So if, heaven forbid, we have an explosion, it's only going to come at us once versus the three times. It might be, I, and we do a lot of safety stuff. A lot of folks come back and talk and cruise. I mean, that the, the story that you, you brought up okay. a few times, it's, it just adds into, again, no line is you know considered dead until we check it. Everything we're doing is safety conscious. Storms, whatever, we'll turn the power on as quickly, but as safely as possible. And just in terms of every day, not being complacent. So I think this kind of... Uh, last year, National Grid brought a uh, speaker in for us, and uh, it was a line worker, you know, go-getter, and uh, complacency kicked in. His job for the day was they were de-energizing an area which was tested and grounded. They were actually going inside the transformer to change a setting. So they did their task. He was a go-getter, like he said. He said to the crew leader, why don't we go help Joe in his area? So they packed up, went to an area, you know, he had all the test equipment. He had a high voltage tester, he had a secondary tester. He had all his gloves, had all his safety equipment with him. And he, you know, they set up and they went up to do his task. He didn't test anything, went up with leather gloves, took off the top of the transformer, which was energized, blew him apart, the line reclosed, that safety standpoint worked, reclosed, opened up, closed back again, and they're saying that's what saved him. You know, the first shot killed him and the second shot brought him back. I guess it all comes down to complacency, guys. He had, you know, multiple tools to use to check the area, and he didn't. So I guess, you know, it all comes down to, you know, we have them, they provide them to us, you know, use them. Mark, can you just go through how the wires are on the poles? Sure. Let's see my right second. Actually, right. top of the pole, we have our primary conductor, either single phase or three phase. You know, at the back of the fire station, you have your three-phase with your three-phase power, your 12208. Goes through the fuse cutout into your transformer to your secondary cable, which is either 12240 or, in your case, 12208 or 277 480 power. Below that, I believe, is our fire alarm, Comcast, and then Verizon. We're always on the top. Like that on purpose, uh, <laughs> Actually, don't, don't wait. <laughs> Sometimes we get calls. People say, hey, there's a yeah. pole leaning. <coughs> you know, what do you think? We've gone down serious. there and we've seen new poles leaning. And yeah. I go, that's just the situation right. we got here. Yeah. I mean, some of those, so you know, you, you're going down, yeah. typically 40 yeah, foot poles, right? Yep. So you're going down right six feet. So you're going down six feet. I mean, any oh, leaning poles, we'll right. come back and do it. You always have the, uh, you know, secure trying to get on it from that end. So you have a motor vehicle crash and that was pole like that snapped forever. the pole. <coughs> Two houses down, it pulls the house service free. And it pulls the cable service off the pole and the cable service wraps up in the house service. That cable service is now pole free, dangling in the app. Yep. It's wrapped up, it's wrapped up in the house service. That's not a lie. Tech, it could be, unless, you know, tested. Yep. Yep. Could be, it could even wrap up into the primaries and carry primary bolts down. You got to look out for that. So, it, it, and as Mike pointed out, it's you, you, whether action or not, pull down. It, it's beneficial not to park near the pole right before it, or at least look at it, <coughs> or the pole after it, because you never know what what that does, the force and all that that could pull it off. We had a pole hit in Randolph uh, last month. The guy hit the pole, snapped the pole right off, had a three-phase bank on it, and it snapped the pole five poles down from it. Snapped that one clean too just from the shockwave coming back. And the other questions usually come up is, you know, that's always two-person vehicle going in. I mean, apart, you saw all the equipment getting tested and all that. 
the booms are tested, you know, the trucks, if you want to get on just in the two person, especially if you if an apparatus were to pull up for an emergency. Actually, um, ideally, you know, a line truck like my truck, uh, it's a two person crew. When we go out, um, trouble men, night guys, day guys, weekend guys, they're a single worker. Um, their role is they're not allowed to go up into the primary zone as a single worker. They have to have a rated guy on the ground for them to go into the primary zone. You know, they can use a hut stick to remove the fuse, refuse it, and throw it in, but they have to stay six or eight feet away from the primary. They're not allowed. Uh, so we're all trained in uh, bucket rescue. If we would have a scenario, we have a device in the truck called GPS which we can hit a toggle switch in our dispatch in Northborough, it will actually come up on their screen with the alert and they will notify the proper agencies and it will actually pinpoint right down to the house where we're at. And we can operate, the, the uh, lower controls will operate, will override the upper controls if we need to get the victim down. And whenever we operate them, we operate them from the step because that step potential could come into play. So we want to be at the same potential as a truck. If we were to operate them standing on the ground, we could be at a different potential and it's going to go through our arms out our feet. So we would operate them from the step. It's a heads up for the detail, guys. We're working up at the end. Don't hit against the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Not that any, anyone does. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, again, this is kind of almost like a refresher type thing just to kind of put in what's going on, some new stuff, understanding that there is some dangers. Uh, the big thing in this is the generators that you're seeing, so that there's a concern on that. And as we talked about the solar panel, there's another one on, on it. So any other questions, anything like that? I mean, Chief knows how to get in touch with us if, if something comes up. Hopefully found it somewhat, you know, educational to a degree from that and just a, a quick refresher from that, you know, from that and, perspective. And, well, and during storms, like, you go to a neighbor, what's flooded out, and why it's down. You know, water being a great conductor, yeah, you know. It's scary, you know We mean? pull up, you want the area de-energized, yeah. Myself, Nick, we don't have an issue. You want, you want the whole town killed, you know. Oh, we can make that happen. You know, you want an area killed, we, you know. There's a street arm that's yeah. got underground. But there's a uh, weather head on the pole if you the street. Did you see the water come out of the yeah, castle? Yeah, the water out of the castle. I'm real. It's just a, like heavy rains. It comes through this neighborhood, which is in Hanson. Yeah. The pole on the corner is in Whitman. It freaking comes out like water. a pump. Yeah, it really it's is. crazy. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't. Well, people well, call all the time. All cables are submersible cables. Right. They're made to be, They're made in, to the be in the water. Right. That, that underground really cable is fully really shielded cable. And every uh, the year there's a storm, people will call us really and they strong. go, hey, there's a lot of water coming, coming out of the weather heads. John Norton, you had a question? Yeah, on that new uh, infrastructure you guys got on Auburn Street, yeah. is that manned 24 7 or? No, it's not. That's a, it looks manned 24 7 because I think we have some contract crews working out of it. They, they were, yeah. So that, I think they're just starting to finish the project up. Yeah. They're doing the last of the paving now, but. Although there aren't people there, they do monitor that station in North Borough 24 7. I remember so, one no, of the no, days they had like something going on over there, like there was explosions or fires, and I was like, well, there's got to be somebody over there taking care of it. And then I thought, about, like, maybe there isn't. Like, it, are we supposed to be like, you know, can we have a course with this? He like, hey, this area, don't go near no matter what, we'll get, you know, just stay back. Get, or is so there cool. an area that, like, if there's a medical there, we can go there, get the guy, and get him out of there? That's, that's a good one. We'll talk to the chief about it. We were yeah. told not to go in there well, without that's correct. Yes. personnel. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Right. You don't, so, you know, going yeah. in a right away or we something like that, with that, you can you can <laughs> see the whole bit. You go inside of a substation, there is wire and bus work and stuff all More over the place. You just don't know, know what you're right. walking yeah. into at that and, point. And usually we have a couple, when we're working yep. in there, saying like a truck, we're going to have a couple people. So it, right to yeah, point. Every now and then, right, the, the, the insulators get carboned up and they yep. flare up. Yep. And people driving up Temple Street or living over there, it's scary. They're looking, it's a big flame, they're like, holy shit. Yeah. Almost yeah. always happens on like a Saturday, a day like this. Right. And you but, get down there and you're like, <laughs> we ain't going there. 
No, but, and we'll we can offer it up if yeah, you want we'll to tour, tour yeah. and see what they yeah. built. Because yeah. I'll tell you, they put a, a lot of money into the infrastructure of it. All new circuit breakers, all new bus work. Those lines feed both, you know, Whitman surrounding area and all the way down south into, you know, Norwell and Cohasset and all the rest of the way. So that's a pretty good you know size station. The public calls on the helicopter and maintain them. Oh, yeah. Freaks people out. They think that uh, there's a guy stuck on the wire that's got a helicopter. We've got this yep. car. Yep. So, like an idiot, he does everything. He said a ladder. Like, the ladder's going to go up and get the car. We got him. We got him. We'll mention later. Some of the things. Just another 350 yeah. feet. Yeah. We got him. Yeah. Some, some of the times we can, you know, if, if, we, yeah. get a, uh, if we get a schedule. We'll send it out yeah. and put it on it's the a website. Good thing to call. That, that can, way we can tell so, the people. Yeah, the you can go right out and look at the lines by a helicopter. <laughs> um, we can do a code red back to all of them. We can isolate it down to the specific neighborhood. Okay. I'm going to go around. It went near the line. Yeah, like so we, we can do that call. after a storm, after a major it's storm. Just after know storm. if a major storm's coming up, there's going to be flying. Yeah. After the storm, we usually do it just to get an understanding of what damage we can see visually. Right. So you know those two. Schedule though, we can probably get a schedule and let you know. So we watch the guy. He sits out on a boom about 30 feet out from the helicopter. He's flying around, strapped yeah. in. I mean, crazy, right? I mean, uh, Chief Reddle wanted to be on the board, so help yeah. The guy so out. Uh, if, if there's a <laughs> lot of people out. signing up for it, you it's know. the craziest looking job I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the other thing, the other thing you're seeing in some substations around the area, it's, it's happening on a few different things. Uh, I don't know if copper price is going up. But you're looking at depths, you know, people jumping in trying to trying to get at it. Oh yeah. You know, from that end, so three dollars a pound. Eat, eat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody might know what the cost is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it might be a police call. You know, whether right. you, I know the fire's been down there, substation don't go yeah. in. Same thing with the police. You know, it's one of those. If you get a call for that, that substation. Yeah, just don't come in. Yeah, don't come in. Yeah. You know, just call us. We'll take care of it from that end. But. There has been some instances where people try to steal it, and unfortunately, not only you have to come, you have to come, and ambulance has to come, we have to come, because it, it turns out not to be a good situation for whoever's <laughs> trying to steal it. So, even though it's not monitored, it is monitored. There's a security guy there, too. Yeah, so, so and, it, and some of our guys are around there. So, it's just a recommendation that if you start getting depth and you hear about it, kind of stay on the outside, we'll be going that way, too. Yeah, and, and we operate 24/7. We have different crews all the way around. So, so that, that I'm sorry, that substation on Auburn Street actually falls under Homeland Security. Myself and Nick, we're, we're not even authorized to go into that substation because it falls under Homeland Security. They have to be authorized people okay. actually to enter the gate. So they have some contractors there and everything else. They're authorized. Yo. I'm just thinking one of those guys had a bad yeah, day is it, the is night it before. Still a trailer and, there? Back, background checks and everything. So the, so the project there is just wrapped up yeah. about maybe three or four weeks ago. So everybody except for a little bit of asphalting left over there, security guys, all all that's pulled out now. Job's complete. They pulled a permit for a storage tank for the generator. Yep. Security up until now. It's and I went down there a couple of times. <laughs> like, you know, the trailer. Yep. Guy signs me in. Yep. You know, but, I mean, it's pretty cool, but it's really... Uh, for us. Wait, wait till one of us get there. Kind of guide through a little bit. Yeah, might be the best thing. Yeah, they have a problem with uh, a couple of homeless guys in the woods uh, stealing stuff and then they burn the pallets. That's that's why they actually changed they changed the fence all the way around the whole outside from a like a two inch mesh down to a one inch mesh fence just for that very reason. People getting inside, so they've upgraded all of them. Any other any other questions? I just want to say during a storm, guys, we do, we're on around the clock. We do 18 hours on and six hours off. But you know, don't think you know come eight o'clock at night that you know all the line crews have gone home. National Grid they put on shifts and they divide you know the number of shifts, how, number of crews, how they feel necessary. You know, we do 18 hours on and six hours off. So. You know, we do go a little slower at night just due to visibility, but uh, we are on the property during a storm. With uh, the solar panels, I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, I just might have missed it. But you were talking about how you can back feed the system with the normal generator. Is it the same system then for the solar panels? Like, is there a way of isolating it just to help? Because I know any overflow power they make goes back out into the grid, so. Right. Uh, there is um, that the inverter, it needs to see utility power to put it on the line as soon as it loses utility power 
it opens up and doesn't allow it to pump out on the line. So they'll still be able to power their own house and not out of the grid? They, they, they can't power their own house either. In order for them to power their own house, they'd have to actually have those battery sets inside of it. Short of that, they disconnect themselves off. And then, and then the utility power has to come back on for five minutes before it's able to come back on and actually supply power back to the house again. So, but, but to the, to the point the guys are making, you know, there's a couple of disconnect points in there, but don't forget, even though we're off on this side, on the utility side, you got the open switch just before and after the inverter, yeah. the lines coming from those solar panels, 600 volts, DC, whatever it is, wherever that disconnect is, might run down the side of the wall of the house, come across the basement floor, to a disconnect, all those lines are alive. And the only way to shut it off is to cover them up. And it can't just be a simple top, it's got to be a dock top. Are they always like run on the outside? I know like a lot of houses are uh -huh. retrofitted, uh -huh. but you can't run them through the walls. It's not like we're going to open up a wall, we're going to find out. I know you guys don't install them, but I just didn't know if you, know, if you guys are up on that. That was the I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen it installed, installed inside, but it's probably just because it's easier to install than outside. I don't right, think there's anything that stops it. But I will, I will say this piece, the, uh, all of that, all the residential that you're seeing goes, like, going up on all the rooftops everywhere, right? All of those go through the local inspector here. So they, they, they actually see those and they kind of go to whatever the national code is at the time, yep. which is right now, right? The other ones, the larger sites, like, you know, I can think of the, you know, Beach Hill and the sites around, where you see these acres and acres of these solar panels. Those, those actually all come through our company. And we get to then say, these are the disconnect points. These are what we need because they are the largest size. Guys, Joe is just going to um, quickly cover the call-ins for the party one, two, and three calls. Because we know that during storms, there are some towns around us, and we may be out running 12, 14, 18 hours with wire down calls and stuff. When we finally get tired, we start to call everything a priority one. And Joe is going to ex briefly explain to you what happens when you move away from the protocol of what a priority one, two, and three line is, and the mess it throws the system into, and it actually delays you. So. Yeah, and, and just to that point, uh, during storms, larger storms, we actually now, as a company, everyone has a storm duty. Uh, we have the liaisons that come out on this thing. Uh, we actually have uh, iPads that they will be using, uh, that, that they can see what the storm is, uh, where the damage is, some locations. Damage assessors are actually getting iPads now too, so as they go out earlier in the storm, they can actually take pictures. Uh, where it is, put the information in, it will come back in, which means you don't have to go out double, double time to see what the issue is, so we'll, when we go to the damage. Even on the, the iPads, the liaison stuff, even pictures are worth, because when we, when we get the call in the storm, in the room, when I bring it over to Jeff, for example, I'm looking and saying, it's either five poles down, it could be four trees, water effort or not, and as we set up from 18-6 shifts, we're in the zones, we can actually use additional crews instead of taking the emergency crews we have right then and there to address emergency situations that police and fire have. So that that some that technology we're trying to bridge it to make it a quicker yet safer way. But even blue or storm days, blue sky days, that priority one, two, three is critical. Uh, the the ones are the ones that we're dropping everything and going. Uh, you know from that end. So that's. One's going to these guys, they're coming down off the bucket and heading right there. It could be just cutting the power off uh, from that end, or it could be a, a car damage from that situation. The three's a little bit easier. The two's are the gray area in terms of a fire. Could be a room fire, you don't know what's going in. What is that? Is that a priority one or two? You know, that's where that conversation is from a perspective of whoever's on the site. You know, it could be just a small room where there's no issue with in, anyone in, inside or, or you're fighting inside, located to a point where the house is starting to get fully engulfed, that moves into like a priority one from that degree. But once that number comes in, and some of the dispatch centers that have been uh, kind of joining might just put one number in. So once it goes into that priority one, it kind of shifts over, even though they thought they were calling a priority three number code into it. So it, it's, it's more of that life or death type thing on a priority one that's critical to where it might be a three. You know, that too is, is is somewhat of a conversation where you know you're walking into a fire, if you're in there battling, you don't want to put an ax through the wall and try to do that, that kind of ticks it back up because that's putting your, your folks in, in trouble. Did I miss anything? No, you have 
So, I, and that's the only thing. I've been working through that one. But, you know, that technology on the storm, we're trying to get more out in the field quicker. Um, I believe working with, with Chief Benno and the, and the Plymouth County Chiefs Association with that zone, where we send the dedicated tree trucks, primary fruit trucks, staying within a certain area, that handles the emergency calls. Because that tree across the road, if you can't get to it, you know what's going on. You don't want to wait. So that, that's what we employ or deploy there. Uh, even, even though they're, they're there for the emergency, we can still do restoration in that point. But if it turns into that multi-pole down with trees, instead of tying up that crew, we have additional resources that we can bring in. So that's, that's where, and, and I believe that's been working out well since we've been exercising that for, I think we're getting hit with every storm. So not going to work, hopefully it shifts somewhere else. But I think, uh, you know, from that degree. So hopefully we covered everything. Hopefully you found it somewhat you know, educational for that. I do appreciate the time. I know everyone's busy. We'll do the tour at the substation just so you know. You know, can't know enough about this stuff. Yeah. That's how it is. No, it's Especially with the panel, the generators. Yeah. Everyone's getting it. No, it, and it is. And next year we're trying to put a solar panel on it just to show what's going on. Um, and the other thing is you see new new vehicles coming out, electric vehicles, uh, you know, going out. What happens there, right? Uh, not as much natural gas vehicles, but that's starting to kick in a little bit. I actually have even LNG, a liquefied natural gas trucks that are delivering. And I think Ward said, what, well, yes, a hydrogen? Yep. There's even hydrogen vehicles coming out. So just to add more to whatever you're looking at when you come up to a scene, key is no why is dead until we say it. Look a couple poles down, uh, you know, and if someone's in the car, unless it's life at that, leave them there until we get there to energize. So hopefully you covered everything. So, uh, you know, I do appreciate your time, really, from the thing. And, and uh, we'll be back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Entire families are backsliding. We're no longer just sedentary, we're stationary. And that's bad news for your bones. At any age, bones need weight-bearing activity to grow strong and stay strong. So go outside, take the steps, play with the dog. Just get up, get out, get moving. Never keep your bones that way. Never heard a word I say. A public service message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons.